My Lords, uh, this is the second time in just over a year that we have had a bill on this topic that has come before your Lordship's House. Indeed, there are those who spoke in the earlier debate who must be uh, pinching themselves slightly to make sure that this is not some sort of weird déjà vu, or indeed, is it worse? Your Lordship's House may recall the movie Groundhog Day. Our Bill Murray, now played by the noble Lord Clement Jones, and Annie McDowell, now played by the noble Minister Baroness Rawlings, doomed to find out that everything that happened on Friday 4th of March today plays out exactly as it did on the 15th of January with an endless uh, repeating time loop. Well, it could be true. As in the movie, the settings are the same. Albeit that we are in fact, I think, in mirror image. Uh, the time of day, eerily, is the same. Uh, and many of the noble lords who graced the debate in January 2010 have returned to give admittedly different speeches today, and we're all the better for that. So, how will the movie turn out this time? Of course, the parallel is not exact, and keen movie buffs would have picked up very quickly that the first time round, the debate was not so well adorned as it has been today by the three categories of person that we must consider, in the words of my noble friend, uh, Baroness Bakewell, the performers, the musicians, and the venues. I mean, we are the movers and shakers, I like that. Uh, but we've had comments from performers and players, like Lord Corwin and Baroness Benjamin. We've even had poetry, which I think is now a performance uh, art, from my noble friend, Baroness Bakewell. And we've even heard from publicans, with thanks to Lord Reedsdale for his uh, uh, second attempt to try and uh, publicise his wares to the House. Um, indeed, Lord Reedsdale went on to suggest that we, he has an entrepreneurial spirit, because I think he's suggesting behind what he said, uh, that we should open up the cellars and make, and make that a venue for the sort of uh, music he likes to hear, or is it Morris dancing? Um, but we also had two excellent and assured maiden speeches by the noble Lord Grade and the noble Baroness Randerson. Uh, Michael Grade, uh, who I still count as a friend, uh, and those who know him will not be surprised that he spoke so wittily and so well about, um, about things. Indeed, it was as if to the manner born which I suppose it was really, uh, given his distinguished family. And, uh, but he, he also brought real knowledge and experience on our topic today. And Baroness Randerson explained her connections with Wales and the Assembly and uh, was able to add in, uh, really valuable insights to our debate, particularly about the situation on the ground in the land of song. Indeed, we learned a lot um, about um, the, 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 the live music scene and uh, we've been a, done a trip down memory lane with many groups and bands being mentioned. Also some useful facts. I didn't know there were 14,000 Morris dancers in the country. They all seem permanently to be performing in my local pub, and I know why that is the case. Now, my lords, may I reassure the noble Lord Errol uh, that, that I am not a Puritan, and on our side we do not take that view to this approach. I should say at the start that I agree with Fergal Sharkey, that particularly in the midst of a recession and with an increased emphasis being placed in our creative industries, we need to stimulate the economy, and it's therefore paramount that we should be creating opportunities for and not stifling our creative talent. As he says, live music can have a hugely positive economic impact, both locally and nationally. As a nation, as we've heard, we produce many of the world's best musicians, and Britain is home to some of the most innovative music entrepreneurs, the vast majority, of course, being small companies and therefore to be cherished. And music is a growth industry. It attracts millions of users to high-tech services. We've heard from Lord Teverson about his work on his iPod. And it attracts millions of uh, people to, to work in the industry and want to, to be there. And of course, like all the creative arts, it drives tourism. We should all back live music, and we should do so to the hilt. I was not involved in the Licensing Act 2003, and I'm happy to admit that I think we quite clearly looking at it that we got it wrong. But I don't, uh, we've only heard one side of the story really today in the, in the debate so far. I mean, clearly we want to support live music and clearly we all want it to happen uh, with, a, with a minimum of bureaucracy and at minimum cost. But there is another side to that. For everyone who is living next to a pub or next to a venue, there is a concern that we should not curtail their liberties to enjoy a peaceful life. Clearly, it is difficult to get this to bottom out and I don't think we should uh, duck away from that. There are two com competing freedoms, and so the first point we must to bear in mind that live performance carries with it a downside in terms of the impact that has on others who may wish to allow others to do that, but may also feel the consequences when it impacts. Secondly, it, there is no doubt that the unintended consequences arising from the sensible but ambitious approach taken 
to merge nine different licensing schemes into a single premises, premises license in, 2000, in the 2003 Act have, have caused us the main problem we're in. The government said at the time, as we've been reminded, that it would um, lead to an increase in live music, but unfortunately the result is that that has not been the case. Pretty much any performance of live music, no matter how small, now requires a license, and the bureaucracy and cost of that has reduced, not increased, opportunities for live music. But there is a third point. The main purpose of the 2003 Act was, of course, not just about music. It was also about alcohol, and in particular the potential to open up and uh, allow premises to open for uh, a flexible period. And it's now, then as now, we still have split responsibilities within Whitehall. We have uh, Home Office responsible for alcohol and DCMS for regulated entertainment. And if you then add in the fact that responsibility for enforcement lies with DCLG and local authorities, you have the absolutely classic Whitehall problem, a three-way crunch with all that implies with difficulty of trying to make progress. And I suspect behind a lot of this, there is that, and I'd be interested to hear the Minister talk about that. Now, clearly, the, the good response to that sort of blockage is to provide the evidence, which is why we've got the Live Music Forum, of which we've heard uh, what they found about this. And I think it's important to recognise that the research carried out by Maury is influential in this matter, and that with 29% of smaller establishments that had operated without a public entertainment licence, not applying for live music provisions when the Act came into force, should have rung very strong alarm bells for those who are responsible for it. And it's worth recalling the, the figures quoted by, by a noble friend, Baroness Bakewell, that 80% of pub managers felt that music would help them survive the recession and that pubs with music are three times more likely to stay in business. So we must have regard to the venues and indeed, as Baroness Bakewell said, to something which is so intrinsically a part of our national life. Now, as we've heard, there is a campaign going. In 2009, the Influential Cultural Media Support Select Committee reported on the Licensing Act and said, to encourage the performance of live music, we recommend that the government should exempt venues with a capacity of 200 persons or fewer from the need to obtain a license for the performance of live music. We further recommend the reintroduction of the two in the bar exemption, enabling venues of any size to put on a performance of non-amplified music by one or two musicians. That, in turn, um, including some, as well as some lobbying and demonstrations, led the government to introduce an exemption for law, small live music events for 100 people or fewer in licensed and non-licensed premises. And of course, we've heard that that is not satisfactory either. 